But a special treat for you this afternoon from the RN Archives, Peter Weir, the director, in conversation with the music show's Andrew Ford. This conversation originally broadcast in 2009 and replayed earlier this year as part of the music show's six-part special called The Sound of Pictures. What we see and what we seem are but a dream. A dream within a dream. It's one of the most distinctive sounds in all cinema the panpipes of Picnic at Hanging Rock, as recognisable as the zither of the third man or the tuba of Close Encounters. But what do panpipes have to do with vanishing schoolgirls? How did the director, Peter Weir, come up with the sound of this picture? Bruce Meaton did the score, as he had on uh, Cars Day Paris, my first film. This was my second film. And uh, we had had a very successful collaboration. I was uh, very pleased with his work. But we were missing something. We were just missing a, a kind of emblem a sort of theme and Bruce was really reaching the end of his patience with it and the producer came in uh, one of the producers and said he would heard this music on a um, an ABC program the night before I think on some terrible disaster in Africa you know a drought or something like that and we got hold of it and it was fabulous laid it in and Bruce said you know well I'd hate to say it because I'd rather compose it but it's a damn fine piece Was that fair, softer than down, smoother than air, nor for the cupids that do lie in either corner of thine eye? Wouldst thou then know what it might be? Tis I love thee, because thou lovest me. So we contacted the people in Paris, because it was, um, you know, it was Georges Zamfier and Marcel Cellier on the organ. And uh, Zamfir was very tricky, very difficult. After some negotiations, we managed to get it. We really just took a, a dub of a track from a fresh new LP from Folkways or something. <laughs> and there it remained in the film and became, exactly as you say, kind of emblematic. It was something to do with such an ancient instrument. It was really touching on the power of nature on the, the great unknown of this uh, country. And here was European culture out in the outback, as it were, and without playing the didgeridoo, uh, which wouldn't have worked, uh, it invoked, I think, a hidden world. When I first heard um, Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto as a young man, my mother would bring home the odd classical record. I mean, when I say odd in number, I mean really three or four pieces. And because she felt we should have culture, and it was a it was kind of sweet Australian thing in the 1950s to, to do that, you know, so we wouldn't, you know, be too Aussie or something. And uh, I was really struck by this piece, this uh, Fifth Piano Concerto, and I, that I remembered the pianist Wilhelm Kempf. And um, I can recall the album cover to this day. So many years later, 1975, working on Picnic at Hanging Rock, and we were missing a piece that needed to somehow sum up some sort of loss without overdoing it of the girls having not been found. And I recalled the piece, asked for the Wilhelm Kempf, got it, played it against it in the cutting room. It worked immediately, the sort of slow movement. And... We bought it, you know, and at that time, of course, what happens when something like that, they said, well, there's a cheaper version. 
you know, or we can get someone to record it. And I, I listened to a couple of other versions, but it had to be that version, something about his timing. To a degree, I think you're playing with the uh, audience in the theatre. And I think that when it goes quiet in the theatre, you know, it creates another kind of tension in, in the room. It sort of can be un, just on the edge of aware of other people in the theatre. Uh, and then the sound comes back and you're taken back in the story. Uh, but I've, I've experimented with it because I love sound so much and I'm so interested in this area in other ways. For example, on Picnic at Hanging Rock, because I knew I had a mystery which did not have a solution, I had to let them know, halfway through the picture at least, that not to expect the conventional ending. In fact, I hope it didn't have one. To give the film a dreamy, kind of otherworldly feel. And so there were ways I did that visually, um, less known are the ways that I did it on the soundtrack. For example, we took an earthquake. I, I think there are certain sounds that we humans have filed away somewhere that we know are extremely dangerous. One of them, I think, is an earthquake. Uh, the deep th rumble of what will shortly be the earth moving. So anyway, I laid this earthquake sound in on the optical track just at the threshold of audibility. It did mean, if I'd made it too loud, it would have been noticeable and distracting. And I just wanted people to suspend all kinds of barriers and to experience it as a child experience of something with a sense of wonder and therefore not expect, you know, expect a plod to turn up at the end and say, you know, oh, those girls have been taken off on a spacecraft, you know, they just disappeared. <laughs> Going home. When are we going home? 